Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're going to be going over the eukaryotes today um, in chapter five. Remember, eukaryotes are the ones that have membrane bound organelles as well as uh, membrane around the nucleus. So let's get into it. These are the learning outcomes or learning objectives for this chapter for those who are interested. Looking at the history of eukaryotes, so basically the evolutionary history here, it looks like bacteria and eukaryotes did share a common ancestor that we refer to as the last common ancestor. It was not a prokaryote necessarily or a eukaryote. It was just something that came before. And this was, um, you know, billions of years ago. So over 4 billion years ago. They uh, believe that organelles within eukaryotes, so those membrane-bound um, functional units inside of eukaryotic cells, originated from primitive cells that became trapped inside of the eukaryotic cells and then you know, eventually served a purpose to those cells and were kept. This includes the mitochondria and the chlor chloroplast. Um, they have their own circular DNA, so that's pretty interesting, right? So we know that the chromosomes of uh, bacteria have are circular. Um, that is the case for the separate chromosomes for the um, mitochondria and the um, chloroplasts. They divide on their own and they have their own two layer membranes as well. So it does indicate that they were in fact cells on their own at some point that then became organelles. Um, the first ones, of course, they were going to be the single cell celled ones, and then it became that um, the cells were working together and became dependent upon one another and then could no longer survive without one another. And that led to the development of tissues and organs in um, multicellular organisms like us. So we look at the protozoa. Um, these guys are going to always be unicellular. We have fungi and algae. These can be unicellular or multicellular. So we think about mushrooms being multicellular when we think about yeast, that it's unicellular. And then we have the helminths. These are like the worms, like tapeworms and such, um, that these are always multicellular. All eukaryotic cells have a cytoplasmic membrane, just like the bacteria do. The nucleus, which contains the genetic material, the mitochondria, which is the energy powerhouse, the endoplasmic reticulum, which is important for protein manufacture and modification, as well as packaging. We have the Golgi apparatus, which invo is involved in modifying proteins, as well as packaging things in vesicles. We have the vacuoles, which are typically for storage of food or um, water. A lot of times that's the case for plants storing water. Um, the cytoskeleton, which gives structure in the cell, as well as the ability to move things within the cell. The glycocalyx, which is a sugary uh, based and often incorporated with proteins. Uh, I don't want to say coating because it can be a coating like a capsule for some organisms, but for multicellular organisms, it serves as our extracellular matrix. So allowing the cells to um, stick together, become um, you know uh, involved as an organ and as tissues and things like that. Some, so all, all eukaryotes have that. Some eukaryotes also have cell walls, um, locomotor appendages like flagella and chloroplasts, which are going to undergo photosynthesis. These are the structures of the eukaryotic cell listed um, uh, alongside a depiction, you know, a cartoon depiction, if you will, of an actual cell. So if you um, want to know where these structures are located in the cell and how they compare to the bacterial cell, this is uh, the figure that you would want to refer to. We're going to go through each structure individually. The flagella, um, flagella of eukaryotes are a lot thicker and they're made of uh, hollow microtubules um, and they do move in a whipping motion, whereas the bacterial ones do not move in a whipping motion. They rotate, right, with their motor-like um, apparatus. Um, the flagella of eukaryotes are, uh, like I said, comprised of microtubules, and those microtubules themselves are set up in a nine plus two arrangement. Um, there's a picture of it coming up next that I want to show you guys. This describes that. Um, so this would be one. Okay. <laughs> Let's divide this up. 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is the two. So nine plus two and the two in the middle, just providing that structural support through the middle of it. So that's how the flagella are actually structured inside. Um, and they do move like a whipping motion. Cilia themselves are have a similar structure to flagella, but they are much smaller and they are much more numerous, usually used as feeding and filtering structures for organisms like protozoa. The glycocalyx is the outermost boundary uh, that comes into contact with the environment. So this is going to be our extracellular matrix in our uh, multicellular organisms. It is a polysaccharide based uh, structure that can include uh, interaction with proteins as well. It has an appearance of a network of fibers, or it can be a slime layer, or it can be a capsule. Slime layer and capsule are also things that the bacterial cells can have. The cell wall that we find in eukaryotes, so this includes the cell wall of plants, but we're not talking about plants in this chapter, simply because we're trying to talk about pathogens here, and plants are not pathogens, but plants do have a cellulose-based cell wall. Um, fungi have a cell wall as well that is uh, made of chitin or cellulose, it just kind of depends on the species that we are talking about. Um, fungi, uh, so that, that's for fungi, and then algae can also have cell walls not made of peptidoglycan like the bacteria. Um, the cytoplasmic membrane that contains everything within the cell, this is a lipid bilayer, phospholipid bilayer with proteins throughout to allow for control of movement across the membrane. Um, sterols work to function for support and um, rigidity of the membrane. They are selectively permeable, so water and uh, non small, very small nonpolar molecules will be able to cross the membrane, um, whereas other things will not be able to. So we would have to have a way to control the movement of other things across the membrane, usually through channels. Sorry, I've got something in my eye. Um, the nucleus, it says the control center. This is where our uh, genetic information is stored. So our, um, our nucleus also has a darker area like it is showing down here in the this figure that stains darker due to the presence of a large con high concentration of RNA in that area. And we call this region the nucleolus. Um, this is where ribosomal RNA is being synthesized for making our, um, ribosomes that will themselves serve as the machinery for making proteins, which we'll get into in the genetics chapter. Um, right, so we do have a nuclear envelope, which is like the membrane that is surrounding the nucleus itself. This gets into the concept of mitosis and meiosis. Um, chromatin is, um, you know, basically what our chromosomes as eukaryotes are made out of, that includes all of our genetic information. Most eukaryotes have more than one chromosome and they are usually linear in um, shape. So they're long linear DNA molecules. They're bound to histone proteins to help bundle it all up and keep it all contained. Um, we can see chromosomes during mitosis um, whenever we have them lining up and getting concentrated We'll have duplication of our chromosomes, um, tightening up of the structure of the chromosomes, and it'd be visible that way in a microscope. Mitosis is division of a cell. So that would be going from a cell, uh, one cell to two cells, just dividing. And then um, each of those are going to be completely identical. So from skin cell becoming two skin cells, right? Um, meiosis, however, is going to be a division that is involved in the generation of sex cells. So that has to involve um, splitting up the DNA, the chromosomes essentially, so that each sex cell has essentially half of what it needs so that whenever it mixes with the other sex cell, that, that combines and creates the correct number of chromosomes, which is important for um, the cells to function properly. With the um, endoplasmic reticulum being the structure of the, the uh, structure of tubes and tunnels um, for protein uh, modification and transport, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is where ribosomes are going to be attached, where we would see protein synthesis, um, packaging, and transport. Whereas in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it's smooth because it's not studded with those ribosomes. It's involved in synthesis and storage of non-protein molecules. 
Okay, this is a picture depicting the endoplasmic reticulum. And the reason that we can see it in this photo is due to the being dotted with these ribosomes here. Next is the Golgi apparatus. This is the site for uh, protein modification and transport. This is going to be um, adding on other groups to proteins to help them um, become like the functional units that they really are. Um, the, they are stacked flattened sacs that are connected typically with the endoplasmic reticulum. And things move from the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, um, to the Golgi apparatus via transitional vesicles. Um, and then they will add polysaccharides, sugars, um, and lipids, fats to the proteins um, in those vesicles. And then they will pinch off those ones that are modified into condensing ves vesicles. And those will contain uh, those modified proteins. They will be conveyed to lysosomes or transported to secretory vessels um, in order to be moved out of the cell um, or used within the cell, maybe for uh, breaking down other um, organisms or um, form uh, matter of some kind. So I just, there was a picture of it. This is just a picture showing the Golgi apparatus, um, the cartoon picture, as well as the actual electromicrogram. All right, they all work together as an assembly line, the nucleus, the endoplasmic particulum, the Golgi apparatus. Nucleus, nucleus has the actual genetic information. We make a copy of that genetic information in the form of a messenger uh, molecule called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is read by the ribosome structure, and then we get spit out the appropriate protein. Um, all this will happen on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, then we will transport those proteins to the Golgi apparatus where it can be chemically modified, have sugars added onto it and whatever, and pack it into the appropriate vesicles to be transported within or out of the cell. So this is just showing the setup of how all these things would work together based on this being the, the nucleus and this being the actual nucleolus where the ribosome parts are made. But anyways, um, and generating a rough ER, then uh, we'll have a uh, you know, um, the message from the messenger RNA being read by those ribosomes in the rough ER and in, made into a protein, which will get um, moved into the Golgi apparatus by these transitional vesicles, um, where it'll get modified and we'll have um, sugars added onto it or whatever. And then, then it'll get moved into those condensing vesicles and can be secreted by exocytosis, exo being outside um, as needed. So the vesicles that we can find inside of cells that have functions for eukaryotic cells, these guys originate from the Golgi apparatus, like we were just explaining. They have a variety of enzymes that can be used um, to digest food as well as to protect against um, invaders. And then we have vacuoles that just kind of hold on to um, uh, solid particles for digestion um, or to be excreted or stored in some way. So they're larger vesicles, just mostly for storage. They're not going to do a whole lot of... Um, that need to be secreted like um you know a toxin or something they're not going to be that so the mitochondria is the energy powerhouse of the cell um, it has lots of folds in it that we call cristae and the matrix is the space in there that holds the ribosomes dna enzymes and other things used by the mitochondrion for its own metabolism it has it is is its own sort of living unit if you will and it even divides on its own when the cells divide um, they contain circular strands of DNA as well. So they're actual, their own chromosomes. And those chromosomes um, are going to match up just like bacterial, like, um, pro, like the bacterial chromosomes would be. Um, with like the circular DNA of them. Right. So this is just going to support that theory of the endosymbiosis of where um, our organelles came from and where our cells came from, evolutionarily speaking. So this is looking at a picture of the mitochondrion and um, the different folds that you can see in here. It's called the cristae. There it is. There it is. And then the space in there, the blue area is the matrix. Um, where all, like we were saying, um, where ribosomes and the DNA of the uh, mitochondria are going to be existing. So this is where aerobic respiration is going to occur in eukaryotic cells. That's where our energy is made. With chloroplasts, chloroplasts are uh, photosynthetic machines. They are going to be using pigments um, within uh, membrane layers 
that will be excited by light. And then when the pigment is excited by the light, um, it allows for energy production that can lead to um, fixing of carbon dioxide into a glucose molecule. And we'll talk about that more when we get into metabolism, but that's the general basis of how photosynthesis works. Um, any organism that undergoes photosynthesis is going to be a primary producer of all organic nutrients that are going to be um, consumed essentially by the consumers at any other level in uh, the food chain. Primary producers, these guys are also the primary producers of uh, oxygen gas in our atmosphere. And most of that's going to be done by microorganisms, not by plants. Um, so that would include algae. Algae are the microorganisms I'm talking about. They're, algae are not plants. Okay. Ribosomes, these are our protein synthesizers. We've talked about them a lot. They do differ between um, eukaryotes and um, the uh, bacteria and archaea. Uh, right. So they can um, work on the same messenger RNA all at once. That would create a polyribosome. So they're all working and just moving down the same messenger RNA all at the same time to crank, really crank out a whole lot of protein by reading that messenger RNA. Um, they have similar structures, the eukaryotic ones and the bacterial ones. The full size ribosome is an 80S. So that's just the size, the weight of it. It's a combination of a 60 and a 40S for the eukaryotes. Okay. Um, for bacteria, we would be talking about a different size. 70S, okay, uh, not 80. Um, the cytoskeleton of uh, eukaryotic cells, this is going to be uh, used by the cells to uh, in, in anchoring organelles and keeping them where they're supposed to be in the cell, uh, moving RNA and the vesicles um, within the cell. Um, just moving things around the cell in general and um, promoting the shape of the cell, the movement of the cell itself. That is the general function of the cytoskeleton. It's sort of like our own skeleton, providing structure as well as allowing for movement and um, support of our organs. So the three main types of um, uh, structures that are involved in as part of the cytoskeleton in its function are gonna be the actin filaments, the intermediate filaments, and the microtubules. And you can see in the picture here, which one is which, um, with the microtubules being the largest, the intermediate, of course, being intermediate size and the active being the smaller ones. Next are the, next we're going to go through the uh, kingdoms of the eukaryotes that we're interested in, at least in, as far as microbiology goes. And we're gonna start with the fungi first. There are three to 4 million species of fungi and we can divide them into macroscopic or microscopic. So literally kind of what they sound like, see it with a bare eye, can't see it with a bare eye. Um, and we kind of can divide that out with our own minds by understanding that. Basic idea of our microscopic fungi. Yeast cells tend to be oval in shape. They will reproduce asexually by budding off. So they will um, make new cells kind of pinch off one another. The hyphae, the hyphae are talking about long threads uh, found in uh, fungi and molds. Whereas the yeast, they can form pseudo hyphae where they kind of stack up uh, on each other. The cells of the yeasts do. And then we have dimorphic fungi that can take um, either form. So the yeast form or the hyphae form. So this is looking at yeast and you can see um, when you look at a yeast cell that the, we have these buds coming off and they're sort of asymmetrical compared to the original cell. That is very typical of what we would see in a yeast whenever it is um, creating new yeast cells and it is budding. It doesn't necessarily divide equally. Fungi, they uh, consume um, their carbon sources and energy sources, they are heterotrophic. So that means they're going to require nutrients from um, a variety of substrates. They are not going to be able to make their nutrients on their own. Um, we also have saprobes that are still also heterotrophs. Um, they will get their um, substrates from dead plants and animals. They'll break down dead things. And then we have the parasites that live off of living organisms and typically cause harm to those organisms. Um, here we can see the fungi uh, kind of growing on uh, the dead or dying tissue of these fruit here and breaking that down and using that as a source of energy, whereas we have the parasitic version on the right uh, with athlete's foot. 
Um, most um, will grow in loose associations or colonies. Uh, we're used to seeing mold, right, and growing it all fuzzy and all that. That's mycelium. That's the intertwining mass of hyphae. You'd see it being fuzzy and all that. A septa is a structure that um, allows, uh, th these are walls that divide hyphae into different segments. So those are actual structures that are going to allow for that division. And then we have spore formation, which are fungal reproductive bodies. And here we can see sporulation going on here at the end of our um, actual uh, you know, hyphae that are, are occurring. So the actual branches are going to be releasing out the spores that are typically a, going to be our asexual spores. Um, those spores can go land on something and then hyphae out and grow um, into a new, um, you know, mold um, structure. So uh, yes, that's basically how that's going to work. It makes sense. We've seen how it works in real life. Uh, okay, these spores that these fungi are making are nothing like, nothing like, nothing like endospores that the bacteria make, okay? So don't even try to compare them in your mind. That's not what's going on here at all. These are um, just for reproductive purposes for the fungi, whereas endospores for bacteria are um, dormant um, structures that are formed by the bacteria in order to survive harsh conditions, in order for the genetic material to survive harsh conditions. So that's not what's happening here. This is for just regular um, reproductive strategy for fungi. So fungi can reproduce by just growing out as hyphae or by fragmentation. So a piece can make a uh, piece can break off of the hyphae and make a new colony growing from that. Or we would have um, the primary reproductive mode, which is that spore formation that we're talking about. So this is asexual spore formation. They will form in the form of sporangiospores or conidiospores. And these guys, um, uh, the sporangio spores are the ones that are going to have like a sort of covering on them. So you can see it here. There's like a layer surrounding it to contain it. Whereas the conidia spores are just kind of open and the spores will just be falling off of it continuously. Sexual spores occur with some fungi um, to allow for genetic variation, um, just like we have uh, whenever we have sexual reproduction. So that's advantageous to a fungi whenever they do need um, to adapt to new environments. When we are looking at fungi and trying to grow them and cultivate them and culture them and whatever, um, we can isolate them on special media. They tend to grow a little bit more slowly than bacteria. So that's the unfortunate aspect of them. Just in general though, not overall, but um, not every single one of them, but just saying. Uh, we can observe them microscopically or we can look at them macroscopically. We can look at the shapes of the hyphae, the color, um, the structures and everything like that. Or we can look at their asexual spore forming structures to identify them as well, which is pretty common for identifying identifying these organisms that way, phenotypically. So this is just looking at some pictures of these uh, sporangiospores and the conidiospores. There are medical conditions that can be caused by fungi, so they can uh, be pathogenic. Um, this often occurs due to opportunistic infections, though. So we have community-acquired infections caused by um, certain environmental pathogens that we can see, um, like sinus infections caused by a fungal infection, for example. Um, a hospital-acquired uh, fungal infection in certain clinical settings, and then opportunistic infections. So those are the three that you can see pathogenic via a fungal infection. So community-acquired that's just like getting sick from like your, you know, your neighbor or something. Um, hospital associated. So you've been ill and you're staying at hospital and you get sick there like you would with MRSA, but that's not fungal, right? But that's the idea of how that works. And then opportunistic infections because you have a weakened immune system, like you have HIV or you're already sick with something else, which they say during the COVID pandemic, India struggled with mucormycosis that uh, infected or killed uh, 300,000 people with COVID or people who were recovering from COVID. So they were more susceptible to infection with this fungi. Um, and it actually can be a pretty significant issue as far as sinus infections are concerned. Um, fungi are also involved in um, allergies. So you can be allergic to them like mold season as we talk about that. 
and then neurological conditions due to toxin production. This is what we might talk about with toxic mold in your house. Some fungi do have beneficial impacts, such as breaking down and decomposing dead materials, as are sap robes, um, forming stable associations with plant roots, um, allowing for better nutrient absorption, uh, production of antibiotics. We know that that's where pen penicillin actually came from, you know, mold. So um, we use that a lot as a means to discover new antibiotics. So that's what they're useful for. Uh, and we use yeasts for the development of um, alcohol and certain acids, vitamins. Um, we have used them for food flavoring. If you've ever eaten cheese, then you know this is true. Um, so development of beer and wine and all sorts of stuff. And bread rising and having that sort of aromatic taste to it is usually caused by uh, fungi as well. So yeast often at that time. Next, we have the uh, protists. So the protists are um, referring to the uh, algae and the protozoa. So those are the sub kingdoms belonging to the kingdom of the protista, right? A protist refers to any eukaryotic unicellular or colonial organism, but not multicellular, that lacks true tissues, because multicellular organisms have true tissues. So uh, we have the algae. These guys are photosynthetic. Um, seaweed and kelp are algae, by the way. Um, so these are what we would consider uh, kelp to be a colonial um, organism. It's not multicellular, not technically. So algae exhibit um, all of the eukaryotic organelles that we've talked about previously. Um, they have chloroplasts with green chlorophyll and they undergo um, photosynthesis that way, the typical way. And they can also have other um, pigments that allow them to react to light in certain conditions or uh, certain times of year when the light changes due to the planet shifting. Um, so algae, um, Right. Most of these guys are going to live in fresh or marine water. Um, the plankton are the ones that are going to be floating around. They are essential in the food web. And these guys are the ones that are most associated with creating oxygen. They are still photosynthetic, but the plankton are. And um, so those are the ones that are going to be most closely associated with photosynthesis as far as the microbes go. We do have association of algae with being ill. Um, it's not necessarily contagious or anything or infectious necessarily, but they can produce toxins associated with um, development of red tides. So the red algae overgrowing in certain areas. So that's a possibility to become um, affected uh, neurologically that way. The protozoa, now the subkingdom protozoa, these are about 65,000 species. They are going to be found in fresh and marine water, but they're also going to be found in just like the... Um, algae were, but they also can be found in soil, plants, and animals. Um, and yes, that's kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> in animals, I don't know how else to word it, but yeah, that's that's what I mean. So um, I like as parasites that make you ill, right? So uh, most of these guys are going to be harmless. There are species that are parasitic and can cause disease and they're pretty severe. They can be. That includes malaria. So don't, yeah, just don't poo poo on these guys. These guys are an issue. Um, they can have structures associated with them. Um, they do not have chloroplasts, but they do have other eukaryotic organelles. And the structures would be like mouths, digestive systems, and legs, and things just like that. Um, the legs would be like uh, their flagella, or which would allow them to have motility. So they're not true. Um, these are unicellular organisms. I just want to be clear about that. But um, yeah, so not true organisms, not true multicellular organisms having true multicellular structures, but they do mimic that in their cell structure. They are heterotrophs. They need food for their um, organic, you know, uh, molecules. They can't generate carbon on their own. They have to get it from somebody else. So uh, they can scavenge dead plants, animal debris, and graze on living organisms as well. Um, they can live on hosts and di digestive uh, digestive juices. I did not even know that, so that's a new thing. So I guess they can live off of that, um, whatever, but they can be parasitic and cause harm to the hosts. That's what a parasite is. They can get around via uh, either pseudopods, which are like 
false feet. So when you think of an amoeba moving around, sort of crawling around with its large little uh, extensions, that's a pseudopod, okay? Flagella are those whip-like structures that allow cells to move around, just like what we see with bacteria. Then we have cilia, which are smaller. Um, they move like in a sort of wave-like pattern and often have to deal with, um, you know, fil filter feeding, but they can be allowed, can be used for moving. And then we have the ones that are not motile. So there's four, four different kinds of protozoa. Um, these are the three kinds of locomotion they can have, but some of them don't move. Okay, so these, um, <laughs> I think that's funny. We said, um, these are the styles of locomotion. And then I know the same four types, even though it just listed only one. But anyways, don't, don't really worry too much about that because we're going to go through them anyways. So uh, protozoa, first of all, can exist in two different stages, the trophozoite, which is the vegetative form, and the cyst, which is like an endospore. That's really what you need to know about it. They, the cysts for protozoa are very much like bacterial endospores. The trophozoa, trophozoites for uh, protozoa are very much like bacterial vegetative cells. Um, they can have simple or complex life cycles. They can exist only as a trophozoite or they can cycle with the uh, cyst stage. So not all of them have a cyst stage. Um, yeah, their life cycle is sort of what uh, dictates their mode of transmission and how they're transmitted as a pathogen from organism to organism. Um, they have asexual methods as well as sexual methods of reproduction, depending on the species. Um, right, so I don't know, I don't know. So let's move on to this. The ones that are able to use flagella can move by flagella alone or in addition to amoeba movement, amoeboid motion, so the pseudopod movement. They have one nucleus, um, they have sexual re reproduction by syngamy and um, whatever. So I don't, I don't need you guys to know too much about the details of this. I will be aware of the different kinds of uh, mo motility that they have, the flagella, the pseudopodia, and the um, cilia, or the not moving. So those are the four different ways that they could go. And this is just a little bit more detail than you probably would need to worry about, honestly. Um, but yeah, I would know that um, pseudopods are amoeboid motion. Um, so this is just going into more details about that again. So it is also probably useful to know that the ones that are not motile are known as spor the sporozoa. And they usually are, again, motile absent in most of them. And then um, this whole group is parasitic. That's very important to know because this includes malaria. Um, we can even divide them up further just based on, you know, how many nuclei they have or um, in their cells or, you know, their locomotive structure and all of that. So that's just how we would classify them in general. We're not going to get into the details too much of that. Parasitology is the study of the protozoa as well as the helminths. The helminths are like worms, okay? Parasite uh, is re referring to, um, uh, is usually the term that's going to be referring to protozoa and helminths. So parasitology, that's how that was broken down. So there can be parasites that are not protozoa or helminth, but that is typically what that term is referring to. Um, so these are the kinds of protozoa that can be associated with human disease. We have the amoeboid ones, the ones that move with the pseudopods that would include entamoeba histolytica um, that causes uh, amoeba amoebiasis, which is an intestinal disease, um, neglaria, phalari, and acanthamoeba. These guys are involved in brain infection. These are the brain-eating amoebas that are uh, found in free living in water. They may be living in your um, water heater right now. So think about that next time you take a shower. They get into your sinus cavity. They cause brain-eating um, amoeba disease, and it's the worst. So 97% um, fatal. And yes, I mean fatal, 97% fatal. So don't mess around with that. And we have the ciliated protozoa. This includes Balantidium coli, you know, illness. 
we have the um, flagellated protozoa. This includes Giardia lamblia, which you get from drinking like uh, water when you're hiking. You think it's clean and it isn't. You get very serious um, uh, diarrhea and intestinal symptoms from that. Um, trichomonas trick is um, a sexually transmitted disease. Trypanosoma brucei and cruzi. These are involved in um, sleep, sleeping sickness and Chagas disease. They are vector born. We do have um, signs that it, that uh, Trypanosoma cruzi does in fact cause Chagas disease here in the United States. The kissing bug that we have can transmit that. Um, leishmaniasis uh, of the skin. Um, what else? Toxoplasma. Toxoplasmosis is a flu-like illness that is, um, uh, the reservoir is cats. And then that's why you don't pick up uh, cat litter when you are pregnant. Just FYI, that's what's going on there. Plasmodium falciparum for malaria. Um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and move on. We're going to come back to these whenever we get into more detail on these diseases in later chapters and much later chapters, but still we are going to come back to them. So um, the pathogenic flagellates, so these are going to include any of them that have a flagella. This includes the trypanosomes, the cruzi. Oh, these are all just going over what I had already said, because I already told you about this trypanosoma cruzi and the uh, kissing bug. So cool. So we are moving on from that to the helminths. The helminths are the worms. Um, this includes flat worms. Um, this can be divided further, the flatworms, into the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, and the trematodes, which are the flukes. So this would include your typical liver flukes, um, like schistosomes um, and um, the Chinese liver flukes. Roundworms. So these are literally, they have a cylindrical body and they have a round shape to them, um, you know, crosswise. Uh, this includes um, ascaris. Uh, the giant intestinal worm. Most of these you can see with your naked eye, um, but you might want to look at a, a microscope for the eggs um, or even the larvae in order for diagnosis to occur if you can't get any larger specimens from a stool sample, for example. Uh, they, these guys in general are multicellular. They have digestive tracts. They have nervous systems, they have uh, muscular systems, they have a uh, cuticle on the outside for protection and um, mouth glands to break down host tissue as well, fighting you from the inside. They uh, often involve the fertilized egg with a larval stage followed by an adult stage. And some of these stages have to occur in separate organisms. They're very picky. And um, many of these organisms sexually reproduce inside of the host that they are infecting. Nematodes have different morphologies uh, between the sexes. The trematodes, the sexes are separate um, or male and female sex organs can exist in the same worm, which would be uh, what we would call hermaphroditic. The cestodes, um, these guys are typically hermaphroditic. Uh, I don't want to go too much detail about this, except to say about that at the bottom, the definitive or final host is the host in which adult mating will occur. You can get infected through uh, you know, exposure to contaminated food, soil, water, and infected animals. A lot of these are going to be fecal contamination of water that hasn't been treated, so uh, untreated sewage. Uh, oral intake or penetration of unbroken skin, penetration of unbroken skin. I'm going to say that again so you can think about that. These worms will literally crawl in through your intact skin, through your feet sometimes even. You're just standing there on the bare ground and these worms crawl in through your skin. Um, humans um, are often definitive hosts for a lot of these. They're you know, a larger organism and can support uh, the mating cycles of the adult forms of these worms. Um, but animals and insect vectors can serve as reservoirs of these diseases. This is just some examples of uh, some of the helminth diseases. I'm not going to go through the details of them, but ascariasis is, is dealing with um, uh, intestinal, the giant intestinal roundworm. Um, we have trichinosis. We have 
onchocerciasis, which is river blindness. Um, some of these stuff you may have even heard of, like pinworm, which is um, worms, or they'll like kind of wiggle out of the anus of children at nighttime and cause anal itching. The worms get stuck under their nails and then uh, can be transmitted that way between children if, or um, back into their own mouths. So um, the trematodes, the so flukes, we have schistosoma japonicum, which is a blood fluke and, and um, you know, would be spread to humans via uh, water, ingestion of fresh water. Um, it can also enter in through the skin. So I don't know. The pinworm, so this is what I was just talking to you guys about, the one that um, causes anal itching, and then it is scratched usually by the child. It's usually ch children that are infected and then um, gets transferred into the mouth via those contaminated nails, right? Um, simple, uncomplicated infection. It does not spread beyond the in intestine, so it stays within the alimentary canal. And usually the only symptoms that you would have involved with infection from this um, worm would be that anal itching. So they otherwise wouldn't have any idea that they had worms. It's usually children, again, because they are unclean. How do we uh, classify these organisms? By their, They have pretty obvious um, structural traits to themselves. We can classify them based on their own shape of the actual adult worms, the size of the worms, um, the degree of the development of organs, reproduction, their hosts, uh, what they hooks or mouth parts, all of that sort of stuff, as well as microscopic detection of um, any eggs or larvae that could be involved. Um, some of them don't need to be even seen with a microscope, right? We already mentioned that. So that's typically how we would diagnose those based on th those traits. Um, you don't always need to have uh, tests for a lot of these. You can see them just by looking at them under the microscope. Again, looking at the um, eggs and the larvae is pretty indicative of a lot of these infections. About 50 species of helminths are parasites to humans. Again, parasitology being the study of protozoa as well as helminths, right? Um, this is uh, a lot of these infections are associated in the tropical zone, sub, uh, not as much as of the uh, subtropics. And we see them more in underdeveloped countries than we do in the developed countries. Um, maybe it could be uh, cases, yearly cases worldwide in the billions possible. So a conservative estimate would be 50 million infections in North America. This includes pinworms for us. Um, yeah, so we think that the absence of helminth infection is actually what could be um, causing the epidemics of autoimmune diseases, as well as allergies, because the systems that are involved in controlling your allergies um, are typically used for fighting worm infections, and people who have had worm infections do not have allergies at anywhere near the rate that we do here in the United States, where we do not have worm infections anymore. So that is a very interesting find, and I hope that more can be discovered about that because I hate allergies. Um, and this is just a breakdown comparing all of our eukaryotes that we have talked about in this chapter, um, comparing uh, the difference if they have cell wall or what they could be, what the cell wall is made of, what kind of motility they have, and et cetera. So uh, I would look through this for a comparison um, when you guys are studying your eukaryotes. I hate when my password expires, you guys. It always happens like right when you're like super comfortable finally with having changed it from the longest time. I got to change it again. I hate it. So anyways, um, chapter five had to deal with the eukaryotes. What characteristics of mitochondria provide evidence to support the endosymbiotic theory? And I'm going to leave that with you guys to answer. And I will see you guys next time for chapter six.